over to our student mentoring session. The goal here is that um, we have four students that are going to present um, early work. And this is going to work somewhat like a poster session, but instead of it being um, just the student presenting one-on-one -on -one with somebody, we want to have the entire community be able to interact with them, to give them feedback, to help them with their work and um, help guide them towards uh, being successful in their academic career. So with that, um, I wanted to see if we have our first speaker here. That is um, Erdim Yilmaz. Yilmaz. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing this terribly. Are you here? I can't see him. Maybe we just move to the next one first. Okay. Our second speaker is uh, Evac. Uh, yeah. Oh man. Last name is uh, Kolokasis. Yes. Hello. Hello. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. Yes, please do. Uh, okay. Uh, can I, uh, the host disabled participant screen sharing says. Uh, can I? Um, our assistant that's helping us here should get that set up here in a second. Is it working now? Uh, no. I can share. Yes, I can share my screen. Okay. Okay, I pinged the Zoom host. Let's see if they get this work in here. Yes, I can. I can. Um, uh, let me try this one. That help? Oh, okay. Yes. Very nice. Ah, okay. Uh, well, sure. So, uh, am I here? Uh, do you see my screen? Yes, it looks great. Okay, thank you very much. So, uh, please introduce yourself and then um, spend um, no more than five minutes, preferably yeah. going through this, and then yeah. we'll have an open discussion. <laughs> yes. Hello, everyone. My name is Yago Vascolokas. I'm a PhD student in the Department of Computer Science at the University of Crete in Greece. I also work in the Foundation of Research and Technology Hellas. Uh, my advisor is Angelos Villas. Today, I'm going to present TerraCache, an efficient caching over persistent memory. Today, there is increasing memory demands. Analytics data sets grow at a high rate. Today, the global data sphere accounts to be at 50 zettabytes, and on 2025, it's going to be 175 zettabytes, 3.5 times higher. So a typical deployment uses roughly as much DRAM as the input data set, and typically, cache data is even larger than the input data set. Let's see an example in Spark where we have machine learning computation. Uh, we have linear regression, logistic regression, and SVM workloads that use 64 gigabytes data set, but the cache data is three times higher. 
So the in-memory caching needs a lot of theorem, but today theorem density is difficult to increase. On the other hand, we have MVM that offers much higher capacity compared to theorem. So today's Spark already uses fast storage devices as PCI and VME uh, storage for cache data, however, at a high cost. Here we show the Spark executor memory that, divide, that is divided into two logical spaces, execution memory and storage memory. In storage memory, the Spark cache the intermediate results that are located in resilient distributed data sets, structures, names in, with the acronym RTDs. So we have a small on-heap cache and the rest are RTDs are serialized and located off heap over a fast storage device. So this approach, we pay a very large serialization deserialization cost. On the other hand, using NVM, we can extend the JVM heap over, uh, over DRAM and NVM. So now we have the executor memory, we have a, a very large storage memory to locate all the cache data on heap. But this approach increases the garbage collection cost that occurs on every garbage collection cycle by traversing the cache data, which are a live object in the heap. So the, we have two ways. We have the on heap caching that provides no civilization, but high garbage collection cost, and off heap caching that provides low garbage collection cost, but high civilization civilization cost. So can we avoid these two overheads, serialization and garbage collection? Well, having a Spark application that we have a data set, we load this data set in memory, and then we, we use the persist, uh, persist uh, a call from the RTD API to cache all these RTDs intermediate results in memory and then perform internal computation. So, by, by loading the data and we create our DDs, then the JVM heap is fully uh, allocated with a new object. Then with persist operation by RDD Apti, we can select that these data are going to uh, live in the heap and we're going to, to do operations uh, using these cache RDDs. So by by using iterative computations, we have a large garbage collection cost between persist and unpersist. And also the garbage collection between persist and persist call needs to scan all objects in the heap. So pay a large garbage collection cost. And at the end, we do an uh, unpersist call and we can reclaim the cache of this uh, at one. So here we, we propose Terra cache that treat cache data objects differently. As we see, the object in Java follow a generational hypothesis, but here we have the opportunity to, to have a different kind of object that the cache data objects now follow a nomadic hypothesis observation. And I'm going to explain what is this hypothesis. The Spark cache data objects are long-lived because they use across multiple Spark jobs. On the, on the right, we can see from page right the cache data access pattern. We have uh, with different colors, the different RTDs that are cached by the application. As we see in the, the, purple, uh, the purple line, that the cache RTDs name three uh, starts from zero and from, from time zero and last until uh, 5,500 uh, 5, seconds. So this object lives across uh, total time execution. So we have intermittently access on this uh, cache data because so we have long intervals without access this data. As we can see from the shape in the, in the right, we have uh, 3,200 3, seconds between the last access time of the purple, uh, of the purple line and uh, after the next access of the next 
purple line. So this cache data, we can locate them on a slower storage device and not in memory. Uh, finally, this cache RDDs has group lifetimes and we can reclaim them at once uh, after unpersist call. So we select in our, in our work to place cache objects in a special heap. So we introduce Terra cache that introduce a second heap over uh, NVM. So execution heap remains as garbage collected heap and maintains this, this JVM heap for execution purposes. And now Terra cache is a second, is a second heap has, has two significant advantages. There is no garbage collection because we get persistent and persist semantics to avoid GC over this cache data. And also we eliminate serialization, deserialization cost by using memory map.io as a result to avoid change objects formats between uh, memory and persistent memory, between theorem and persistent memory. So in this, uh, in this array now, I conclude the properties of Terra cache compared to serialization to serialization. Terra cache has low garbage collection cost, keeps object formats as in memory, allows direct reads, allows partial reads, and provides high capacity. So this is the overview of Terra cache. We have the Spark sector memory that is divided into two logical spaces, execution memory and storage memory. Now we, we select to split these uh, two parts into uh, in the two different heaps. Now the JVM supports two heaps, a JVM heap, which is garbage collected and locates execution memory. And this heap is located over DRAM, while the storage memory is located in Terra cache, which is memory mapped using up direct mode over persistent memory. So the design challenges we had to solve is the interaction between Spark and JVM to ensure correctly between the two. Yep. Uh, um, this is too long. Uh, we had okay. five minutes. We had five minutes and it was 15 minutes total. So we need to, to cut off here. Okay, I'm going to, okay, I'm going to conclude. Okay. Uh, ensure the correct between the two heaps, extend the temporary and the cheat uh, to update, to support updates in Terracast and keep Java class loaded and reachable object from Terracast alive. So to conclude, uh, Terracast, uh, we see that Spark incurs high overhead for cache hard to this over fast storage. We observe that Spark cache data follow a nomadic hypothesis and we introduce Terracast which both reduces garbage collection and eliminates serialization cost. And finally, TerraCache improves performance on graph analytics and machine learning workloads up to 62%. Thank you for your attention. I would like to answer your questions. All right, thank you. Um, let's see, does anybody have any questions? You can turn on your, your audio, video, or put it in the chat. If not, I have some to start off with here. I have some questions. So I think it's sure. work because it absolutely helps users in Spark to improve the performance. Yeah. At the same time, I think it's very important um, to consider a proper baseline. So when we compare performance in Spark, we should all, it's an improved version in Spark, let's say, we should also consider what happens if you try to do the same operation in a more optimal fashion. For instance, why do I say that? Because I saw a lot of papers where they say, yeah, I improved Spark. And when I then looked at the native workflow, the native workflow without Spark was basically 100 times faster. And that means you didn't need a, a cluster and that made the whole story basically um, funny, right? Because, um, so in that sense, I, I just really encourage you to, to, to try to be honest and try to compare this because it of course will be useful and it will be beneficial, but at the same time, try to search for a, a baseline um, that is a bit outside of the scope of Spark, maybe. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Uh, this is this um, contradiction now is based. Our baseline now is the store is the current storage level of Spark that use uh, a small on-heap cache and serialization to serialization. 
that's how we compare Terracash. We compare it with Spark. With the okay. native Spark? Yes, absolutely. So at least, you know, do, do some math, like what kind of throughput do we get? And then compare this throughput that you get now with the available throughput of the machine. Is it close to peak performance of the machine or are you just, let's say, 10 megabytes a second? Right. Ah, okay, okay. It is something easily yeah. that can be achieved, I think. Yes, yes, yes. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Um, I also, I just put into the chat um, a link to a paper. I was on a PhD thesis committee four or five years ago with um, a student at Georgia Tech who was looking at uh, basically a uh, very similar kind of problem. Uh, they took a bit of a different approach. They were managing... They didn't use persistent memory, but they were still managing the garbage collection. I just wanted to make sure you were aware of that as a related work for what you're doing and um, to see where that path will go as well. That way you can make sure what you're doing is uh, not been done before. Okay. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm going to check that. I'm going to check this. Oh, again. never, hold on. I put it yes. to the wrong person. Let yes. me get it to everyone here. Okay. So, um, so one of the, the other questions I have, because I've been looking at persistent memory myself recently, and uh, one of the challenges is that um, the performance compared to an NVMe device is about three times higher, but the cost of the devices are five to 10 times higher. And uh, um, given that there, there's um, a price performance um, difficulty there, uh, trying to justify making that it's worth it. Um, what are your plans of looking at that kind of angle as well? Because that might be um, kind of looking at this in a, a staged approach where you start with just DRAM, then you can have the extreme at PMEM, and then you can also say a more cost-effective option that gives you nearly a performance might be NVMe, and uh, you can show then multiple options and um, give people more information on how to think about how to best optimize their system for the kind of performance they want. Because they may even want a mix of NVMe and PMEM, yes. depending on um, what their budget is and how critical the performance is in their application. Well, uh, well, thank you. Uh, yes, and now I don't have such, such kind of results, but yes, we, we study uh, which, uh, how, how to use NVMe and how to use NVM and which kind of workloads are better to use NVMe because uh, you gain performance and which workloads you can gain performance with NVM. And yes, I think, yes, this parameter with, with the capacity, with the price, yes, could be in the picture. Yeah. Yes. And, okay. and I think that uh, having a, having NVMe that gains performance with that, I think it's more catchy because you can uh, its uh, its capacity is multiple uh, terabytes, uh, and the cost is it's cheaper compared to PIMAN. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't think going to SSDs. Just regular uh, SATA-based SSDs is probably no, going to no, make no, much PCI. sense. Oh, no, no, no. I agree. I was going to say is yeah. that, that the next step back would be SSDs and then hard drives um, as kind of overflow space. But because um, the the fact that a device has um, a persistent characteristic um, is, in my mind, not completely relevant. The real thing here is you're looking at um, performance and capacity and you're going to treat it like memory no matter what its performance characteristics or its um, persistence characteristics are. And um, so it really doesn't matter um, if it's a disk or if it's PMEM, you're gonna take a copy of the memory and you're going to shift it there essentially as is rather than doing any kind of special um, serialization, deserialization as was being done in your previous example you pointed out. Um, so you could just treat it like memory rather than as a storage device, and that will um, 
that that way you can have kind of an apples to apples sort of comparison that's purely what your options are yeah yeah uh, surely like yes we we want to treat this storage as an extension of the memory right so does anybody else have any questions or feedback I have just a, a little, a, a short question. So, um, Spark is just an illustration of the problem. Uh, actually, you, you, your research is really about trying to exploit the, uh, the, uh, the characteristic of the data structure. So, you, you choose Spark, but you could use uh, something else. Uh, well, now we use Spark, but I think this work can be extended in big data, in JP, in managed runtime big data analytics that use caching, uh, that use caching, for example, uh, uh, in, in other, for example, uh, the new version of the Flink is going to support caching. So yes, we're going to explore another frameworks that we can, uh, use TerraCache to improve their performance. Uh, this is the one approach. Uh, the other approach is try to use it for general purpose Java application because we gain performance from garbage collection. So we can check another kind of object that we can push it away from the managed heap in, in the TerraCache. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Yes. Okay. All righty. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, hopefully, this was uh, helpful for you. Yes. Yes. Thank you very much for okay, great. for your for your comments and for uh, <laughs> for your questions. It was very valuable. Great. Valuable. Great. Thanks. Thanks for participating. Okay. All right, so our next uh, presenter, we can actually go back to our first presenter who is here now. Um, so Erdim, can you share? Erdim? I cannot hear him. I can't either. I think that is a Zoom issue. He just he did a mute unmute. I saw that. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Great. Sorry. Um, um, I was late because uh, I didn't cater for the uh, for the time zone difference. Sorry. <laughs> uh, we're we're good. We're we got it covered. Can you see this? All right, so, I'm sharing. so yeah, so if you can share your slides or, and um, try to keep your talk to five minutes so that we have 10 minutes to talk and give you some feedback afterwards. Sorry, was that to me? No, no. Okay, can you see my uh, slides? Not, not yet. There we go. Okay. So um, my research uh, subject and this presentation is about smart mapping of scientific work full screen, with Evelyn. heterogeneous resources. Can you do full screen? My part? supervisor is Julian and full screen? Uh, Brian Lawrence. Air team, can you do full screen? Sorry again? It's not full screen properly. Maybe it's a Zoom issue, but we just see the PDF from Evans. Just press F5, Control L, or I think one of these. Hello. Oh, well. 
Just make the window bigger. Hello. Yes, can you make can you make go to full screen rather than showing us your your view? Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you see the screen I'm sharing? It's the wrong view, but yes, we can see it. Are you there? Hello. Can you see the screen now? Uh, we see the whole screen, but we still, the problem was the slides were not full screen. You need to make the slides full screen. No, no, that's not the presentation mode full screen. We want one slide to be your entire screen. It should be a five, Erdem. I don't know if you are Windows slash Linux, not the Mac, then it's a five. I'm sorry. I will. I will switch. I will switch laptops. This is not working. No, no, no. Just go back to that. We don't have time for that. Uh, it's so tricky with Zoom as well. Next time we use our system again. <laughs> okay. So just just go ahead and present. Okay. So uh, um, the drivers of this research is the the data sizes approaching the exabyte scale and it's not possible to uh, move the entire data um, and new and accelerated hardware are consistently being integrated into hpcs and data centers and it is hard for existing scientific workloads uh, being adapted for new hardware and utilizing such hardware in existing workflows requires domain knowledge so how can we address these problems um, our, our approach was um, uh, smart utilization of accelerated devices to tackle the first problem alongside data streaming and core to data solutions. And to address the second problem, uh, we, we will be presenting a solution where uh, the workflow is abstracted from its execution uh, such that uh, the, the scientists would care less about the optimizations required and the execution. And the, we will also gain uh, adaptability and scalability um, by doing so. Uh, a simple use case uh, to, to uh, make it more clear, our, our proposal make more clear. Let's assume that a scientist wants to read an n-dimensional data from a file and multiply the content with a scalar and then save it back to another file. So uh, in this hypothetical workflow, there are three operators involved file read, multiply, and file save. And let's assume we are given three modes to do this job uh, with different CPU cores and architectures, operating systems maybe, and different storage types and different hardware computation capabilities. Um, what are the challenges around mapping these tasks to, to these resources uh, in the most efficient way? So, to get use of the underlying uh, hardware, you need to restructure your code so that it runs uh, faster and better. Uh, but to do that, you need a domain knowledge to, to, to use the accelerated devices to get use of them. And, and also which combination of these nodes, given nodes will perform better, which task when it's mapped to which host will provide a better result. And how can we adapt to the uh, Exascale data sizes. So these are the challenges to be addressed while doing such a mapping. So what do we propose? We propose uh, a framework where uh, a predefined set of operators can be used to structure the workflow for the for the job in hand. 
and the scientist will be declaring its workflow through these well-defined operators. In this case, a simple read, multiply, and save. And then the framework will be taking these and creating um, these operator DAGs, uh, direct assignment graphs, into task DAGs. And uh, in the meantime, uh, having the well-defined operators in place, we also have uh, an associated machine learning model uh, relating to each of these operators to, uh, to be able to predict the max span uh, given an input size and a host to run on. So the, the machine learning model associated to each operator uh, will, be, will be trained with uh, various uh, input features and varying input sizes so that the uh, the, the max span and the performance behavior of this operator will be, uh, will be accurate uh, when, when it comes to the prediction of the max span. Um, for, for, given all, for all given nodes with different uh, computational capabilities, the machine learning model will be predicting uh, max span of this operator uh, for, for each node. And by doing that, we will be able to um, calculate a better cost model for the total max span. So for these three operators, the tasks max span and the communication costs and overall all of these constitute uh, the total max span. If, if we can find uh, accurate um, max span predictions for these operators, given any host, we will have an accurate total max span. So what are the mapping tasks to resources um, uh, challenge? It is mostly deciding on which operator to run on which host. So what are uh, the These are- Erdem, uh, like Erdem, that's your time. Sorry again? Your time is up. Oh, okay. Um, okay. Then maybe I should conclude then. Um, uh, I am at the literature research of my review and possibly investigating computational offloading with InfiniBand supporting hardware and experiment on various machine learning models and evolutionary, um, evolutionary techniques to do the mapping. Uh, and these will be the next investigational points. Thanks right. for listening. I yep. didn't manage to right. do it as I expected to happen. All right, so, so uh, I'll start with some questions here. Um, if you could leave your slides there so we can kind of go back to them. So I wanted to ask some, um, having that summary up, I think is gonna be helpful for, for the discussion. Yes. Yeah, uh, so no, actually that summary slide's good. But you yeah. had at the end there. Keep going, at the bottom. Number 22. Number 22, the last one, sorry. Yes. So um, this really talks about the, um, some of the things that you're looking to do. And that's really the kind of thing that we want to focus on since you've already gotten some work done and try to look at um, how to help you uh, figure out what to work on next. So the uh, machine learning model part of this um, What's the advantage of calculating the make span um, for these different kinds of operators? Are the operators themselves things that are going to be um, generic that are used across workflows or are they uh, a, a user that says, this part of my workflow is this kind of operator, therefore um, you're trying to predict what its make span is? Well, I mean, the, the operators will be readily available and their performance metrics will already be there. And for right. the custom ones, the, we can provide the option to, to train a model uh, as, a, as a side artifact, as a tool. So, the, but, the, but for example, if you want to go back to the earlier slide you wanted to show that showed the different operators. Yes. Yeah. Right, so the read, multiply, and, and save. You got a read operator, the arithmetic operator, and the write operator. Those are 
particularly the arithmetic uh, operator is intended to work on a particular format of data. So how is, what does that look like? Well, how does it know how, what, how to work on the data? Well, each, each operator has its own um, input mechanisms, uh, depending on where it will be running, uh, either on the same host or, or uh, network hosts. So the, each operator has a defined, well-defined interface uh, according to what, what it does. I mean, of course, a read and a multiply is, is somewhat different in nature and operation. And, but they're, they're, how they interact is, is streamlined. And I mean- let, let, let me rephrase my question. Yeah. Let me rephrase my question. If my input in one time I run is a 3D domain, my th a 3D array, and the next time I run, it's a pair of scalars. Um, and in the first case, I also give it a vector. So I'm going to do a, a matrix vector multiplication, for example. So it's a, uh, so it's a 2D array and a, and a 1D vector. And you're supposed to do a, a, me a matrix vector multiplication. And in the second one, you're just multiplying two scalars. How is that interface, how does the, the operator know, looking at that data, what it's supposed to do? Well, the, okay. I didn't work on specific examples, but I mean, uh, that that defines the operator, isn't it? I mean, the the way well, well, the operator but, 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 is some. Um, let let me answer a little bit, Jay. Here. Sort operator, it will be okay. Will be waiting for its input to finish, and if if the read operator, say taking uh, an input file uh, of a, of a, of an n-dimensional data, it will be reading chunks accordingly. But the the way the data will be connected to the other uh, will be it will be streamlined, and the way, uh, however, the operator uh, gains its input and operates on it, uh, will have a similar matching output. And that output, if, if it's matching the multiply, then they can connect each, with each other. I mean, I haven't worked out the practicalities around around different scenarios, but um, I think that's doable. Okay, so Julian, you wanted to add a yeah, little detail I, I there as well. So what he described here as operators, this is just an example, but in, in reality, we assume it's I not a basic you. operator. Really, sorry. It's not just multiply, right? It is more complicated than that because doing that on this fine-grained level will be not feasible and not making sense, right? So I, I, I think it could actually because yeah, I've I mean, done work like that, yeah. I think you know it, it. You need it if you do it in that fine-grained level. You would need stuff like LLVM and such to create the code optimally and partition it. But initially, what Adam will look at is more coarse-grained tasks. And of course, we will look into other people's work trying to integrate it more fine-grained. That, but you know, I think this is really future work. Okay, right. Because the, the work I had done previously um, was looking at trying to do generic operators for workflow processing as the glue between different phases. And um, because we used well-defined um, data formats for the data transfer, we could look at it and um, hopefully figure out what we needed to do. That's why I was trying to figure out is, was that the kind of setup for this, this multiply operation or was it more... Um, something else that was going to be the mechanism. That was where I was headed with that. All right, so um, any other questions? All right, so I guess uh, my one last question then would be, um, how uh, for the machine learning models, how much um, training data do you think you need? And is that going to be more work, do you think, than um, the value that it might generate later? I think there may be audio. Okay, yes. Um, well, um, 
I think I think uh, considering considering uh, the operator's uh, nature. Uh, I don't think I will need too much data. The problem is around the features that is required to train the model. So which features of, of, a, of a node or the algorithm plays a part in, in estimating the best uh, max span? Um, mm -hmm. It's not just the data, but more of the features that, re that, is, that are required to train the model. So- uh, Right, okay. Yeah. No, that, that's good. That you're you're thinking in the right direction that's good i like it um, the, these will be the uh initial set of um parameters to train the machine learning model all right okay all right thank you sorry we had we had issues there that uh, okay. cut our time a little bit short and um so our next uh presenter is going to be uh frank yeah, hello. 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 Um, I will share my screen. All right, we're not seeing it yet. So what exactly is the problem? I'm not hearing anything either now. Frank, are you talking? Yeah. Okay, Frank, you're muted now. Well, maybe we move with the next one. Time is short. At least. Yep, all right. We'll let Frank figure out his technical issues. Uh, Luke, you ready? Sure. Okay. Let's hope I don't have any more technical issues. Uh, share screen. I can say one surely recognizes that Zoom is hosted in the US. US participants, it works but for people here overseas. Problem. Kidding. Oh, guys, a lot. Yeah. You guys can see it, right? Yep. Looks Wonderful. good. All right. One more time. Um, All right. There we go. Yeah. So I'll be talking right. about some of the work that we did in profiling the IO software stack for distributed storage systems. So HPC and big data applications store data in distributed storage systems like OrangeFS, BGFS, ZephFS, et cetera. And the performance of these applications depend largely on hardware and software related factors like network speed, network topology, the storage device type, node local storage stacks, and the distributed storage system itself. So, however, as networking and storage become faster, software overheads become more significant and are, they aren't uh, weighed away by the hardware factors like network, which it typically used to be. So in this work, we wanted to analyze how much software overhead local storage stacks and distributed file systems impose. 
So a little bit of background, flash storage is fast enough that software overheads are no, no longer negligible. Persistent memory file systems are being developed to utilize PMEM as fast storage and integrate them into the storage hierarchy. Furthermore, network latency and bandwidth are becoming increasingly faster. Various works are discussing accessing PMEM using RDMA and using NVMe direct over uh, network to directly access NVMEs. InfiniBand HDR right now is currently at 200 gigs per second with uh, 130 nanosecond latency. To put that into perspective, PMEM latency is around 125 nanoseconds. So it's about RAM-like in performance. Uh, furthermore, we're also noticing a trend that storage nodes are moving towards flash. So even storage nodes can benefit from having an, a more optimized storage stack. So in order to try and quantify these overheads, we split it up into two pieces. The first part was quantifying the overhead on node local file systems. And the second part was quantifying it on the distributed storage system. Uh, so for the node local file system, uh, we trace the POSIX system calls that are used to write to block devices. Because typically uh, distributed storage systems like OrangeFS use POSIX to store data. Uh, we profiled the read and write system calls over ext4 and XFS to identify the overheads. And we did this in Chameleon Cloud over a SATA SSD. So our results showed that the read and write spends about 26% of IO time constructing and merging IO requests within the kernel. We found we did this for a sequential write of 100 megabytes and sequential read of 100 megabytes. In order to verify this result, we built a simple kernel module to pre-allocate some of the in-kernel data structures for IO. And we found that the performance improved 10% over XFS and 20% over ext4. In this case, we only did 64 kilobytes for the block size because of limitations. We didn't want to spend too much time uh, implementing this module just to prove this point. So next, I'll talk about the distributed storage system overhead. So this was a preliminary test. I wouldn't quite say it's finished, but uh, we ran an experiment in Chameleon Cloud with the Haswell InfiniBand nodes. Uh, the network types used were the 10 gig and 56 gig, and we used emulated PMEM as the storage type. We varied the local file systems used, and we used OrangeFS as the distributed storage system. We profiled the OrangeFS client to see where the software overhead was in the client. And we also profiled the server to see how much time was spent performing IO to the PMEM. So the result of this experiment was somewhat obvious. The network was the main bottleneck because it's not 200 gigabit ethernet. Uh, we found that less than 2% of the total runtime was spent in IO to the PMEM and around 10% of the IO time was spent in uh, OrangeFS. So for OrangeFS, we found that some of the performance indicators was with the uh, views copy page. It's essentially copying the data from user space into kernel space in order to do the IO. So that was a source of overhead on the side of OrangeFS. But uh, we do see a trend, of course, that as since the network was largely responsible for the performance degradation, the bandwidth tripled when we moved from the 10 gig to the 56 gig network. So this indicates that optimizing the node local storage stacks could be an improvement to performance when you have a better network. Now, from these results, we found that there's room for improvement for node local storage stacks, even for SATA devices. Uh, we found significant improvement, 10 to 20%, just by pre-allocating some data structures in the kernel. Uh, we also see that improving node local storage stacks is important for compute nodes because, of course, we saw a 10 to 20% improvements on the node local storage stack. If you're storing data directly into a node local burst buffer, of course, you're going to have a performance improvement. But it's also likely important for storage nodes, which tend to contain slower storage. While the network and storage are becoming fast enough to merit these changes, the 56 gigabit Ethernet wasn't enough to really merit it. However, if we were to use simulation like codes instead, we can use the results from this work to validate the simulator. So that's all I had to talk about today. Uh, I'll leave it open to questions or discussion now. 
Great, thanks, Luke. Uh, does anybody have any particular questions before uh, I get started? So I had been thinking, I think there should be some kind of user space EXT uh, library that should allow you to test even bypassing the VFS. And I'd be curious, you know, what kinds of performance one can get or lose by bypassing even the whole kernel. Maybe that's something to add as another reference for your local testing. I did. I just didn't show the result. And how uh, the, so ext4 has a mode called DAX, which allows you to bypass the kernel for when you're writing data to storage, but it only works for PMEM. And in comparison to that, there is, it does improve performance by like 200 or not 200. Uh, it doubles your performance over just regular ext4. That was the result of direct access to storage. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, but there's, oh, go ahead, I think um, even in terms of managing the inodes, the dentries and stuff, there's still some things happening in the kernel. While I agree the write pass will be bypassed with this mode. So I'm just really thinking of trying as just as an alternative, a user space EXT libraries and just checking, you know, what's the difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But the other result is great too. Really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so uh, Glenn Lockwood asked, um, he missed a technical point. How are you intercepting syscalls or are you intercepting libc or s tracing? So uh, I did some things. For, I'm, you're referring to the kernel module, I think, or are you referring to the profiling? I'll assume you're referring to the kernel module. For that, I just built a simple interface. I used uh, Netlink sockets so that the application can talk to the kernel module. Okay. All right. Um, so one, one question that I have, the, um, hold on. the, um, the results of this really point out the mismatch between the, um, the storage device performance and the network performance. And even with a super fast interconnect, it's still going to be the devices are radically faster than the network. So um, given what you know so far, what would your preliminary recommendation be? Should we have lots of nodes with a big network connection and a tiny storage device or a few nodes with a bit of storage device but a ton of network connections? So it, I would say this is probably something better left to a simulator than my speculation. But uh, if you, right now, the motherboard has limitations. Like I, if I have 50 NVMEs in a single motherboard and I write to all 50 NVMEs at once, I'm probably not gonna get 50 times the performance. Yeah. Uh, but if I have 50 network links and 50 different computers, I may get roughly 50 times the performance. It's, yeah. It depends on like if you're using switching, the network topology, but uh, right. it could, maybe it could be more like a call to make motherboards better yeah. so that uh, you don't have to get the network cost so much. So, so let me rephrase the question because that, that that's one answer, but it wasn't quite where I was aiming. I um, uh, so where I was aiming really was, should we build nodes that have, say, one NVMe device and 50 network links, or should we focus on having an SSD and a network link per device, per compute node? SSD and network link. Because it, the SSD is slow, but we don't care because the network is even slower. I see. Uh, and that's so a really cost-effective way to do it. So... Yes, that could be, that would be very interesting. Uh, I think this is something that we could look at too with, uh, with codes. But uh, from a preliminary analysis, if the network cost is going to outweigh the storage cost, then it's better to have a storage device that matches more closely with the network than to just directly use the, to have a bunch of network links that go to really fast storages. Mm -hmm. So I want to bring to this discussion as well. So how about instead, if we use the client nodes, like some systems do, and we, we have every client node has 
is a slower, let's say, SSD, right? So it would at maximum take 10% of this node's network bandwidth. Yes, it would introduce some jitter, but in the long haul, I mean, we'd save so much because we of, of network kind of, and we wouldn't need NVDIMs and stuff. NVDIMs are useful for more compute workloads, like if you wanted to expand main memory. But uh, as, as a burst buffer, I don't think PMEM is as useful. I know that isn't exactly what you're talking about, but uh, I would say, yes, I would probably rather use a SATA SSD for a burst buffer over a network link than a PMEM device. Yeah, I was more like, should we use, should we abandon the idea to have client and server separately, but the clients become the servers? Oh, so you're talking yeah. about like not even having. Yeah, I, I just made a stupid mistake to mention NVDIMs at the end. Okay, it was just. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's a uh, works out there that talk about doing a uh, shared burst buffering on a compute where you have the burst buffers on the compute nodes instead of in shared burst buffers. So that could be more along the lines of what you're thinking. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Luke. We're out of time now, but um, that was nice. All right. So now we're going to try to go back to Frank if he's ready. I'm ready. I've installed the uh... Uh, the Zoom application, and I will see if I can get this working. Let's see. Okay, can you see my slides? Yes. Very good. Well, okay, I'll start by introducing myself. My name is uh, Frank Gadban. I am a PhD student uh, at the Hamburg University. And uh, I'm also a DevOps engineer at Der Spiegel. Uh, and since I have every day like some type of interaction with the cloud, I decided to tackle the performance uh, or the conversions of HPC and cloud and PhD work, mainly focusing on the storage part. Okay, very good. Uh, when referencing to HPC and cloud conversions, most people think about moving some processing tests to the cloud, which is known as cloud bursting, or uh, they think about the HPC offering from typical cloud provider, also known as cloud HPC. However, let's get back to the definition of the term conversion. Convergence is the fact that two or more things uh, come similar or come together. And from the technology point of view, it means the tendency of different systems to evolve towards performing similar tasks, uh, eventually leading to a seamless integration. And uh, since we know every supercomputer cluster consists of three main pillars, the computing, networking, and storage parts, uh, we saw in the recent years that the compute and network technology used in both HPC and cloud are to a large extent similar. However, we still see divergence at the storage level. Uh, this is why I addressed the convergence at the storage level uh, of HPC and cloud. And I will try to answer the many, many or several uh, high level questions like can we use HPC and cloud storage concurrently? And which IO interfaces to use, uh, to what extent can we use a cloud storage in HPC environment and what overhead to expect. It is actually moving your source demanding application from on-premises to the cloud, a cost-effective solution. The main point to consider are of course performance, scalability, the cost, since uh, running more cloud in the cloud introduces the need to carefully assess which instant type to use, where to run these workloads, and most imp importantly, what storage to use, to actual paying for every uh, input output request. And of course, the security plays of data in the cloud plays uh, a, uh, a critical role. Uh, first of all, since I want to assess the usage of cloud storage inside HPC, 
I've investigated the and cloud storage is based on HTTP or REST. Uh, I investigate or investigated in a previous work the REST overhead inside HPC. We uh, defined a performance model based on hardware counters and validated this model. And we came to the conclusion that if the same transport protocol is used, this TCP REST can provide similar latency and throughput to native HPC protocols like HPC, while of course enabling better portability. And uh, since the recent years, we saw an evolution of the HTTP protocol, mainly with the introduction of new standards like HTTP2 and HTTP3. Uh, we think that those uh, HTTP protocols may have a potential to rest performance, and especially in light HTTP. This is the provided the model, and uh, these are the results of the. Uh, so comparison between REST and MPI done on Mistral, the supercomputer in uh, the German Climate Research Center. Uh, now let's take uh, a real world uh, scenario and actually the assessment of the perform of the S3 performance by the HPC. As you know, Amazon Simple Storage Service, you can see the GS is right, it's called the S3. Right. Okay, Frank, Frank, you got less than a minute. Wow. Okay, I guess everybody knows S3. This is like an open standard. It was, it is like the de facto standard. Uh, we want to, uh, it didn't get like many attention in the, in the research world. And this is why uh, we, uh, we, uh, we used HPC Bank's benchmark, namely IO500 and, uh, and MD Workbench to quantify the performance of the S3 API. We did uh, several tests against uh, S3 implementation like Swift and Minio and against cloud provider, Google IBM. And we explored the possibility to leverage existing HPC system. We defined perf different performance matrix, latency, throughput, and scalability to identify the performance issue inside the S3 implementation. And we were able to uh, provide alternative S3 implementations specifically for HPC workloads. Uh, won't get into that. This is the HG model that we uh, implemented for uh, IOR and uh, or IO500 and MD Workbench. Here we did some tests against Minio, the different modes of, of Minios, and we came to the conclusion that the best performance uh, is when the Minio is running on the same node uh, to deliver the SG interface. And uh, uh, these are some density graphs uh, for uh, direct cluster access. Of course, cluster is provide the best performance. Uh, cluster is used as a backend system in this case. And uh, these are the different menu modes. And this is the Swift H3 right. from Mitchell. And this are the results from uh, different provider. IBM gave the best performance that were, were done also on Mitchell. And this is the S3 embedded library that we implemented to cluster. This is a library wrapper that converts lib S3 code uh, to POSIX calls. And this is our view of a convert uh, model. Uh, if every ap application is SPC and cloud can talk S3, then we are able to, uh, with one line, we, can, uh, able, we are able to move the application in the cloud or in HPC. And the other results of the embedded versus menu versus rest. Okay. IP. All right. And All right. That's it. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thanks, Frank. So um, you zoomed through the last part there, which was what we needed. So we had some time for you to talk. Um, stay on your conclusion side, because that would probably be a good prompt for people to ask you questions. Okay. Um, so I'll start with uh, and allow anybody else in the audience to ask questions first before I start asking questions. And uh, I'll be happy to answer them. Yep. All right, we don't have any popping up yet. So I will ask my first question. And that is, um, is going from S3 to POSIX um, the right choice? Or is should you go from S3 to a storage system specific API? So for example, if the storage La, the storage system for the platform is um, Deos. They have their own API, which has been optimized for how their storage is, is organized. Actually, but they do have the POSIX interface for kind of a generic setup, yeah. Yeah, actually we try to use only standards 
S3 is the mm -hmm. most used standard in the cloud, and POSIX is actually also the standard inside HPC. So you, you're right; it, it reduces some overhead. However, we're trying we are trying to to, to do some type of abstraction. Uh, in our case, uh, for example, in uh, on Mistral, we were using Luster. It, it, has like a it's a POSIX shared system that that uh, and we were uh, doing this uh, short here I get the slide for it yeah uh, we were uh, translating mm -hmm. uh, S three calls just to POSIX calls right okay um, so the the goal is a a simpler layer that provides the most compatibility rather than the highest performance connection. You're right. However, we have we have measured that the the performance is, it's not like direct cluster access. However, it's it's good enough to to have this abstraction. Right. right. So the the I IO side add, is certainly. I want to add. Uh, yeah. So the reason why POSIX was used because we wanted to actually test scale out performance of S3, which normally you cannot do easily in an existing cluster. The the reason is that you have only a limited number of S3 gateways, for instance. But in our case, we knew that Luster, it's, we can run on 100 nodes and it still scales sufficiently because we have one, more than 100 OSTs. So basically we wanted to run this also on the same OSTs and then compare what is the cost in terms of comparing Luster to S3 over Luster, right? So that was... Without, without investing in extra hardware. I mean, okay, if right. you have the extra okay. hardware, you can, you can access S3. Right. However, we don't want to invest yeah. in extra hardware. And we, we saw with Minio that the performance, uh, the best performance achieved were, was actually uh, when using the, uh, the Minio, we, we call it local gateway, or when the S3 uh, gateway, uh, the S3 interface was published on the same node running the tests. All right, great. Uh, so Glenn Lockwitz has a question. He says, S3 doesn't let you do the same things as POSIX, for example, update in place. So what approach would applications need to do um, for this kind of scenario? Actually, S3, as far as I know, why, why, isn't, able, uh, why isn't S3 able to do an update in place? I guess this is a supporter from S3. I don't know S3 well enough, but this is Glenn's question. Let's see if he's got a... Hey, uh, can you hear me? This yeah, is Glenn, yeah. go for it. Yep. So I was thinking like if you need to just flip like a 4K extent in the middle of a, an object, does S3 let you do that now? Like if you, you want to change just a part of a file like you can in POSIX. No, no, you should like change the, the whole file in this case. You're right. Okay. And this is actually how our, our performance benchmark works. It's actually, uh, it doesn't create a fragment of a file, it actually creates an object in itself. It gives like the best performance we can obtain from S3. Uh, mm -hmm. However, uh, this is how S3 work, you're right. Yeah. All right, so let me ask a second question here. The um, uh, the half of the problem is getting the IO to work and the other half is getting the application stacks to work because they're also looking for particular infrastructure. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, um, the, the container system that they're using or the virtual machines they're deploying may not be something that's available uh, on your HPC system, particularly a virtual machine system. Um, how is this kind of thing going to be handled or is it a matter of you still need to rebuild your applications and it's just that you now have some tools so you have fewer code modifications to make? If you mean like uh, containerization, if you uh, actually, if you mean if you want to move your applications is containerized into the, the HPC or the other way around, not not containers, say virtualization. So you have a virtual machine. Okay. And you want to move that from the cloud to your HPC machine. Uh, actually, you should like uh, if you want you have an application that's running on the on a virtual machine on the cloud, uh, it would be able to run on on a node 
Uh, well, only if, if your HPC cluster allows you to run virtual machines. That's one problem I know on, on many HPC centers is that you can't run virtual machines. And in many cases, you even have difficulty running containers because okay, so um, they don't want to put in the support for it. So you should change. Uh, yeah, there is no other way as changing the, your application. If your application is meant for the cloud, uh, it should, you should, uh, your application, if, if, for example, you have like a Python application, you should be using the same library inside uh, your HPC. Actually, this is a portability problem that we, we also have. However, I'm not addressing this portability problem. I'm addressing the uh, storage uh, access problem. And we sure. provided an interface a, that we mm -hmm. can access from the cloud and from, the, uh, from inside HPC. For the portability right. problem, we have many, many, there are many solutions. Uh, I guess if, if your HPC don't allow you to, uh, to run virtualized pro uh, virtualized machine or containers, it should give you like uh, a module uh, system which you, uh, that you can load the library that you want as module. This okay. Practice, I guess. Okay. So, um, kind of a side comment slash question. Then I'll get to my next question here. Um, would this be motivation for the HPC centers to add support for things like virtualization? Do you think there's enough um, compelling need that they might uh, uh, be able to look at the evidence and say, okay, I now have a way that I can run it without destroying my, my carefully crafted HPC resource? Uh, actually, as I said, I'm not addressing this part. Uh, I understand, I'm part, asking you to however. speculate. From, uh, yeah. from my point of view, uh, I guess we, we should assess the overhead of the virtualization. Uh, there are lots, lots of solutions out there. I, I, won't, I, won't, I won't go into virtualization. I would personally go into containerization or using a, a container orchestration uh, tool like Kubernetes. However, we should really assess the, uh, the overhead brought by those solutions either uh, virtualization or uh, containerization or a uh, container a containerization uh, orchestration solution like uh, I, the same Kubernetes. Right. This should be so, assessed so, very carefully. I'm not doing that in my job, I, in my, I, in my I, I, work. I'm I, just I, focusing on- I understand. I'm, I'm ask, let, me, let me ask a question. Let me ask the question again in a different way so that you understand what I'm trying to get to. So okay. um, I understand this is not what you're doing. I understand this is not your job. What I'm asking is, is that from a speculation standpoint, based on what you know and what you can see and project based on what you know, um, do you think that there is an argument that if the performance case can be made in terms of the overheads and such, that um, you have um, the beginnings of an argument for an HPC center to enable these capabilities? If, if this overhead can be reduced to to, to zero or to bare metal. Well, 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 even if it's 2%, that 2% might be worth it given the other advantages. 2%, it's worth it. As far as I know, it's, it's more than 10% at, at the moment. I've, I've, I've seen some paper, uh, especially for Kubernetes, and it's more like 10%, and we, we can't use right. the, all the nodes. If we can reduce this to 2% and we have the scalability and uh, the same performance than uh, right. that we expect from a bare metal, then I'm for it. This is the way to go. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, thank you. So par part of being a PhD is being able to have people ask you questions that are outside your area, but related, and they're going to want you to speculate on them so that, because you have a level of expertise that they don't. And so you may know half of the answer, but they know none of the answer. And they're asking you to be able to say, given that you know half of the answer, what do you think about the other half? What do you think that might be so that we could think about this other larger problem or different problem? That's part of um, how PhDs communicate very mm -hmm. regularly. Um, we're in fact pretty terrible about that. We always ask each other questions about things we, we know very little about and we know that the other person we're asking only knows slightly more and then we actually generate answers for ourselves. Very good. It's kind of what we do. Questions. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's where I was kind of headed with that. It's, it's to, to prompt you to kind of think in those kinds of directions and, and leave yourself open to say, okay, I, this isn't what I'm doing, but 
maybe given what I know, these are the things that I would recommend. And these are the other things you should look at as a further consideration. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for the yes. opportunity to yeah. <laughs> share my knowledge. Yeah. <laughs> to, yep. To, um, uh, I mean, yeah. Yeah, the, the, the one goal that we had is really to figure out and kind of reduce the overhead that S3 had. Because if we assume we could deploy an yeah. existing HPC center and it would have zero overhead, right? Then you could do more right. and you would be able to run more applications that run in the cloud on the data center. So you would have already some part of this convergence achieved. And the next step, as you said, is kind of this VM part. And then it would be the same. And, and really we wonder, is S3 a, a performant API and I, that, that we can use in the data center? That's, and how can we improve it? Yep, anyway. Yeah, this is what we're actually trying to do. And we, we did like uh, in, uh, introduce the alternative S3 implementation just, just to be able to do that. All right, uh, anybody else have any? Um... All right. Um, with that, thank you, Frank. That was good. Thank you. Thank and, you for having me. Um, Thank you very much. So I believe next we, uh, Julian, we want to take a quick break and then go to the next talks or do we want to just go to yes. the next talks? Yes, I think we st we go at five with our next session. So we have our eight minutes break now. It's one last talk. All right. Glenn, maybe you can quickly check that it works. I would love to do that. Yeah. Wonderful. That would be easy. All right, my video works. Yep. And... Windows. My your screen sharing uh, presentation should work in a second here. Good. Fr Frank, can you stop sharing? Yeah, I'll try to do that. Should I try resharing? Um, you options. Oh, there we go. I can just switch over to Glenn's screen. There we go. Look at that. All right, we're good. Now move, move one slide, Glenn. Sure. <laughs> no, this that's good. I've gotten in a case where I've gotten halfway through a presentation and realized that Zoom stopped broadcasting my updates. Um, oh. Are you on the second? Can you see the second slide yes. now? Yep, we can. Yes. And you can both. You can go back. Okay, so okay. We, 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 we meet at five. Yep, seven minutes. China, I think actually it was a nice session. Um, 